happening. Now we're gonna move on to speak about regulating this, this, um, this muscle contraction. So we're gonna speak about the recruitment principle. And this is the ability for muscle to call on additional units for help, so to speak, okay? So when you're lifting something light, like you're lifting a paper, a pen, or a book, you're not using all the fibers, all the fascicles in that muscle, okay? You're probably using a few of them, the smallest ones first, depending on how light that, that load is. Now, recruitment is this ability for the muscle to call on additional units. So we can recruit another muscle fiber. We can recruit another muscle, fa muscle fascicle as the load gets heavier. So if you're lifting something heavier, a full box or a large, a large um, bag or whatever, something that's heavier than say a pen or paper, you're gonna recruit some other muscle fibers which have more muscle fascicles, which have more active cross bridge cycling. So just, be, just like we said, more cross bridges equal more force, the recruitment principle really shows that, right? If you call on more muscle fibers, we're gonna generate more force to lift a heavier load. Now this is typically at the level of the motor unit, right? Let's remind ourselves what a motor unit is. It's that motor neuron and all of the fibers that it's innervating. So we cannot recruit one fiber of a motor unit. We can recruit the entire motor unit, right? I'll say that again. We cannot recruit a single fiber of a motor unit. We must recruit that entire motor unit and all the fibers that are, that are being innervated, okay? All right, so let's look at this example here. We have the spinal cord, we have two motor units, motor unit X and motor unit Y. Now, looking at the size of motor unit X and Y, we can see motor unit X is a much smaller motor unit. It has less fibers. It probably has a smaller axon diameter. Those fibers probably have a smaller fiber diameter as well. We'll talk about that in a minute. Motor unit Y is a larger unit. Again, it has more fibers, and it probably has a larger axon diameter as well. It's probably a bigger neuron. Um, so if we stimulate and recruit motor unit X to start, right? Um, and if you look at motor unit Y on its own, so those two motor units individually will generate um, a set amount of force. And then if we combine those two motor units, we will double the force generation simply because we've doubled the amount of fibers that are actively cross bridge cycling, okay? So recruitment is this ability to call on additional motor units and all the fibers that each motor unit is innovating. And that is gonna translate some more force simply because we have more fibers, more cross bridge cycling. Make sure you make that connection, why there's more force. There's more force because there's more uh, active cross bridge cycling, okay? Let's talk about some of the properties of the recruitment principle. So we already said that the more fibers that are, we recruit, the more force we will generate, okay? And so if we recruit additional motor units, we will activate that motor neuron and all of the fibers that it is innervating. And this will translate to more force generation. Now, in terms of differentiating different motor units, we have small motor units that are typically involved in delicate movements, such as the eye movements, like the extraocular muscles are smaller motor units. They have more delicate, more fine touch ability versus large motor units, say the glutes, say the hamstring, say the gastrocnemius, right? Bigger muscles have bigger fibers and are attached to bigger motor units. Smaller muscles for more delicate movements have uh, smaller fibers attached to smaller motor units. And so we can talk about the number of uh, fibers in that motor unit. So again, smaller motor units have a smaller amount of fibers, and that is because they're for more delicate, fine touch movements, right? Again, the eye movements, movements of the fingers and things like that. Whereas larger uh, motor units are for strength, right? Power movement. We'll talk about the gastrocnemius in, in an example later on. And it's really a, move, uh, a muscle for power or for strength. And so it's a larger motor unit. There's also the fiber diameter. So how big each of those fibers are. So let's differentiate these two things. The number uh, or the size of motor unit here really translates to how many fibers are attached to that neuron. Is it three fibers? Is it five fibers? Is it 10 fibers? Whereas the fiber diameter really dictates or really represents how big are each of those fibers, right? How many myofibers are in each of those fibers? How many sarcomeres are in each of those fibers? 
So the amount of fibers and the, uh, the size of the fibers is a part of the motor unit um, distinction. Another part of the motor unit distinction is the, um, the axon diameter of the motor unit. Okay, so smaller motor units have smaller cell bodies, smaller axon diameters, um, whereas larger motor units have larger cell bodies, larger axon diameters. So again, if you look at a, muscle, a nerve like the sciatic nerve, it's a huge nerve, right? And that tells us about some of the kind of muscles that it's gonna be innovating. Those big powerhouse muscles for strength. But if we look at some of the uh, nerves or neurons that are innovating, say the muscles of the fingers or the muscles of the eyes or toes, they're smaller in their axon diameter. And again, that dictates to us that the fiber diameter um, and the number of fibers attached to those units. So when we look at the uh, recruitment idea, there's this size principle that comes about. So in order to recruit additional motor units, we must recruit the smallest units first. This is the size principle. Larger units take too much energy out of the body to, to, to depolarize. Again, think about a larger neuron. We're gonna need more energy to depolarize this neuron to sustain an action potential down the length of this neuron. And so we'll recruit it last. We'll recruit smaller motor units that have smaller amount of fibers, that have a smaller fiber diameter, that have a smaller axon diameter before we recruit large motor units that have larger fiber diameters, larger axon diameters, and have more fibers attached to the unit, okay? So this is the size principle, small units and then larger units. And this makes sense for the body, right? Smaller neurons are easier to excite um, and they're gonna take less uh, energy out of the body. It's much more efficient to recruit in that order, small versus big. Any questions so far? Any questions? Any questions? Okay, the last thing we'll speak about here is the velocity of shortening. And this is really how fast that muscle contracts, right? Um, and so we know that three principles exist when you look at muscle contraction velocity. The first one is that the latent period of shortening increases with an increasing load. And all that that means is as a load gets heavier, the latent period increases. What did we say the latent period was? What's happening in the latent period? There's no contraction, there's no force generation, that's one. What else is happening in the latent period? Why is there no contraction? Hmm? Time it takes for the action potential to translate into calcium moving into the cytoplasm, right? That excitation contraction coupling process. And so if we have a heavier load, it's gonna take more time to warm up that machinery. So as the load increases, the latent period increases. If you're lifting a pen or a paper, you can do it much quickly or much more quickly in terms of how fast your muscle contracts than if you're trying to lift a heavy, a heavy bag or a heavy box or something like that, right? So the latent period increases as the load increases. We also know that the duration of shortening decreases as the load increases. So the duration of shortening is how, how long you can sustain that contraction. And think about this in layman terms of how long you can carry something that's really heavy, right? The lighter something is, the longer you can probably carry it, right? The longer you can sustain that muscle contraction. Whereas as it gets heavier, you cannot you know, carry it around for as long. So as the duration of shortening decreases, or as the load increases, rather, the duration, how long we can sustain that contraction decreases. And then the third idea here is that the velocity of shortening decreases as the load increases. And again, this makes sense. How quickly can you pick up an empty box versus how quickly can you pick up a full box, right? The velocity, how quickly your muscles can contract will begin to decrease as your load increases, okay? And if you look at this curve here that is showing load versus the shortening velocity, we'll see that when the load is zero, our velocity is at its maximum. So we can lift an empty box very quickly. But as the load gets higher, our velocity decreases, right? This inverse proportional relationship. Meaning that as the box gets heavier, the, the speed with which you can pick it up begins to decrease. 
until your load gets to its maximum and your velocity gets to zero. And at a zero velocity, this basically means that you aren't lifting the box, that you aren't able to move it because it's just too heavy. So the rate of change uh, of the distance is shortened. Um, the, when the velocity reaches zero, the maximum tension is gonna be greater, whereas when the load is heavier, the tension is uh, zero, okay? So that's an inverse proportional relationship. And this last slide here has a graph that's sort of summarizing these principles. So again, looking at the distance shortened versus the time and looking at three types of loads. So a very light load here in green, an, a medium or um, moderate load here in blue, and then a heavy load in red. And so what we see here are the three principles